Verse 7, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the faith, face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Clearly he's talking about the Levitical law, the Mosaic law there. Um, it was written and engraven in stones. That's the Ten Commandments. Uh, Moses comes down from the mount after receiving the Mosaic law. That's when his face glowed back in Exodus. Um, that there, that old covenant is described there, verse 7, as the ministration of death. Now verse 8 is a description of the Melchizedekian priesthood. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? It's the ministration of the Spirit. For the ministration of condemnation be glory, that's the old covenant, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So, when Hebrews 8, 6 says, He hath obtained a more excellent ministry, the ministry of the Levitical priesthood and the Mosaic law and the Old Covenant is a ministration of death and condemnation. The ministration of the New Covenant under the Melchizedekian priesthood is spirit and life, or righteousness there, it says. Verse 6 tells you the spirit giveth life, so you can also say it's life. So the more excellent ministry, you know, they looked at the Levitical priesthood as having life. Uh, well, the law is holy, just, and good, but the problem is I am a sinner. Yeah, if I do the law perfectly, it gives me life, but no one does that. Only Jesus Christ did it. So when the perfect standard of the law comes against my unholiness, I am sentenced to death. The wages of sin is death. So what the law ministered, the Mosaic law ministered, the Old Covenant ministered death. The New Covenant ministers life. That makes it a more excellent ministry. The next thing then, it says in Hebrews 8, 6, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Okay, so how is it better? I wrote on your outline, better covenant because old was conditional upon man, but the new covenant is conditional upon God. Look at Exodus 19. Exodus 19, when he gives that old covenant. You think of covenant, you think of a contract. If I make a contract to buy a Lamborghini, that's not a good covenant. A better covenant is if the dealership makes a contract with Bill Gates or Donald Trump. Somebody who's got money. Because if they make the covenant with me, I'm not going to fulfill that bargain because I don't have $400,000 or whatever it costs for that Lamborghini. I don't have the money. That's not a good covenant. It's a better covenant to make it with somebody with billions of dollars because he can pay. And that's the idea here with the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is made with man. It's conditional upon man. Uh, man, man is imperfect. Man sins. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So, the old covenant is, Israel, if you do this, then you will, do, then you will be this. Well, Israel isn't going to do it. They're sinners, just like all of us. They sin. So they're not going to obey his voice, so they're not going to be a peculiar treasure under the old covenant. So God makes a new covenant. Look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. See, it was not a good covenant because 
they couldn't fulfill their end of the bargain, just like I can't fulfill the end of the bargain to buy that Lamborghini. I don't have the ability. It's not a good covenant to make. They broke the covenant. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You notice there, Israel doesn't do squat. It's, I will put my law on their inward parts. You can see that a little better. Go over to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. See, again, nothing conditional upon man. It's conditional upon God. Ezekiel 36, 24. God says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Again, nothing conditional upon Israel. So how is it a better covenant? It's because the old was conditional upon man, but the new one is conditional upon God. That makes it a better covenant. They broke the old covenant. Man can't keep it because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God is holy, holy, holy. God cannot sin. So we know that God will keep the covenant. That makes the new covenant better than the old covenant. And then the final thing in Hebrews 8, 6, it says that the better covenant is established upon better promises. And so I put on your outline, what are the better promises? The old covenant promises a curse. The new covenant promises blessing. Let's look at Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27. Now, you're, there are blessings under the Old Covenant. Look in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Uh, again, notice it's conditional. If thou shalt hearken diligently to observe and to do all his commandments. So if they do that, verse 2, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Verse 3, blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Verse 4, blessed shall be the fruit of the body. Five, verse 5, blessed shall be thy basket. Verse 6, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. So there are blessings under the old covenant. But the problem is they're conditional upon man. They have to obey. There are a lot more curses. We read all the blessings right there. Um, well, not all of them, but uh, we read blessings. Now looking back in chapter 27, Deuteronomy 27, and look at the curses for disobedience. Verse 15, Deuteronomy 27, 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image. Verse 16. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. Verse 17, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Verse 18, Cursed be he that maketh a blind to wander out of the way. Verse 19, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger. Verse 20, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife. Verse 21, Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast. Verse 22, Cursed be he that lieth with his sister. Verse 23, Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Verse, verse 24, Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly. Verse 25, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. Notice verse 26 tells you the law requires perfection. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Perfection is required. And since none of us are perfect, 
all were under the curse of the law. They did not receive the blessings. Um, and in Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 15, uh, you see the curse picked up again. You know, verse 16, Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Verse 17, Cursed shall be thy basket. Verse 18, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. Verse 19, Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Um, and it goes on. Um, all these things, all these curses here. Uh, it's a very long chapter. It's 68 verses. Um, so you can see the curses that are under the law. There are blessings there, but there are a lot more curses. And if they don't obey the law perfectly, they're under the curse. Now let's contrast that with the New Covenant. Go to Ezekiel 36. We read what God is doing in verses 24 through 28. Um, now let's look in verse 29 and see some of these blessings. Ezekiel 36, verse 29. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. Verse 30, And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Um, verse 33, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. Uh, so you see there that whereas the law, the old covenant said, cursed be, cursed be, cursed be, and everybody was under the curse, in the new covenant there's all these blessings, and they're all under the blessing. There is no provision here in Exodus, Ezekiel 36 about a curse. I mean, there are things, it talks about remembering, you know, in verse 31 it says, then you shall remember your own evil ways. Uh, you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities. So there's a remembrance of evil, but there's no curse in the sense that God doesn't curse them a famine. He doesn't take away the land. He, you know, he doesn't do anything bad to them. It's all blessings. There's no big list of curses. So I wrote on your outline what better promises mean. Uh, the old covenant offered a curse. The new covenant offers blessing. So... Uh, that's the big difference. And so here they are trusting in the Levitical law and the Levitical priesthood. And God told them, you know, back in chapter 7, you should have noticed that you didn't get anything good under that system. All you got was death and condemnation. There's no life in there because you didn't obey it perfectly. You should be looking for something better. And that something better is the Melchizedekian priesthood under the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for life in your name, that you did not leave us Gentiles under the curse of the law of our own conscience, condemned to hell, not able to do anything about our dire situation, but you sent your own Son to live in a sin-cursed world and live above that curse, living without sin, so that when he died on a cross, his blood could atone for our sins as a substitute sacrifice, and there could be life given to us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we thank you for that gift and help us to continue to trust in your word and have faith in, it says, in what it says over what man says so that we may experience that life in sanctification on a day-by-day -day basis. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, next time we'll pick up in verse 7 here in Hebrews 8.